Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I'm Thomas V. Miras. This podcast is an offering to the Holy Family and, less importantly, a production of CatholicCulture.org. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. As you know, based on a number of episodes I've done, I've found it important to combat feminism in various ways. I've had people like Carrie Gress, Mary Stanford, Abigail Favalli on to talk about that. I've done a number of episodes on that to the point where I've kind of realized, you know, boy, I really need to be doing something addressing men and the way that men are supposed to be. And I thought a great way to start doing that would be with my present guest, Dr. G.C. Dillsaver. The Catholic University of America refers to him as the father of Christian psychology. He is known in recent years for having developed psychomoralytics as an alternative discipline to clinical psychology and the mental health professions. But today we'll be discussing his great 2010 book, The Three Marks of Manhood. How to be priest, prophet, and king of your family. Dr. Dill Saver, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. As I mentioned, I've already done a, a bit on this podcast, Combating Feminism. In fact, my most popular episode ever was on authority and submission in Christian marriage with Mary Stanford, who is a theology of the body a person. So she, she looked at it through that lens. So we did some work in that episode to establish you know, that simple fact as Catholic teaching using, you know, late 19th and early 20th century encyclicals, as well as citations from St. Paul and St. Peter and, and so on. In this episode, I'd like to, well, well, let me say this. So your book is all about this concept of Christian and Catholic patriarchy. And what I'd like to do, if you're amenable to it, is not so much spend too much time proving that that is Catholic teaching so much as explaining what it means and discussing it in further depth, because I would like to sort of address this to people who already accept that teaching on some level, but are looking for a deeper, a more practical approach to what that actually means and a deeper theology of it. And that making that, that deeper theology, seeing it really the deep spirit of it, you know, that's so important. The rest will follow. You know, to say that a man is, you know, the head of his family to espouse patriarchal principles is not really saying much in a Catholic sense because this is something that, you know, again, you know, the pagans themselves and, and natural law, just the fact of even as John Paul II would say, you know, the, the brute force, which is a pagan concept. So we want to take it deeper, the spirit of the law, the spirit of that relationship. And that's, then that makes sense. And so, yeah, I'd be happy to address that spirit. And one of the things that you mentioned, you know, right away, you talked about how you have been in previous episodes, focusing on femininity. And, you know, I, I want to start off that, that same way, actually, because it's going to be the touchstone for that masculine charism. Because what really Christian patriarchy is about is about devotion to the feminine, devotion to the feminine as a sacred thing. I'm so glad you said that. And I think one of the things that I came away with in this book is the extent of your real internalization of that idea of servant leadership, but also of the conformity of the Christian patriarch to the cross to humiliation. And then to me, that was the mark, actually what marked this book out as, as an authentically Catholic approach in a, on a very deep level. There's something that you say at the beginning, and I'll just read a, a couple of short passages. Note well that the call to Christian patriarchy is a call to service and love rather than selfishness and arrogance. Thus, it is a call that in more ways than one is contrary to modern sensibilities. The authentic Christian patriarch must constantly die to himself, that is, constantly do violence to his pride and self-love. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ also loved the church and delivered himself up for it. Thus, this call to Christian patriarchy is essentially a call to love God and others unto the sacrificial death of self. 
what strikes me about that is that word essentially. So I think that probably something many people are guilty of and something I've been guilty of to a certain degree is thinking of it as the man is head of his wife. This is something established in scripture and in church teaching consistently. It's not culturally conditioned. Well, it's culturally influenced in how it manifests itself, but fundamentally it's not a cultural thing. This is permanently repeated church teaching. But I've thought of it as, well, there's that data point, and then there's husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, almost treating them as two separate if related things, as opposed to that being the actual essence of Christian patriarchy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And and even as a matter of fact, St. Paul, when he is reiterating this patriarchal order, who was actually going contrary, I think it was Pius XII that says in those, in his um, elocutions to newlyweds, going contrary to a popular culture that was actually had this a feminism to it and was breaking that order. So he was reiterating that, you know, saying, you know, you know Christian women, you know, please, you know, follow natural law and, and, and deeper still Christian law in this docility, in this submission. So it is not culturally bound. And of course, today, though, we need to speak about it more emphatically because it is culturally foreboden. So it's a need to then really express this and be intentional about it. But at the same time, then to make sure that it's that really purified Christian patriarchy. And for the first time in history, because it's not being propped up, but quite the opposite by our culture, we need to base it completely and totally on Christ's commission and purify it again of all pagan influences. Let's return to that, the historical point in a second. I I just realized I should probably say to my listeners, I'm sure some of you are, who agree with the teaching of St. Paul, are still maybe balking at the word patriarchy, because to you it might mean, you know, any number of things that the culture says that it means that are not of the essence of Christian patriarchy. It simply and literally just means the rule of God the Father over the universe, the rule of Christ over the church and of the Pope, the Holy Father, as his earthly representative, and the rule of the Father over the family or headship, if if you want to say. So it really is that simple, and it's possible that other people may use that this word in a less pure way. So, you know, I don't know if we have to insist that everybody use that word, they could say headship, you know, of the father or whatever. But I think the fundamental reality is such that it's, it's certainly fair, you know, linguistically to simply call it patriarchy. Granted that you you make the proper Christian provisos for it. So I think that, you know, if people are listening and might be not sure if that's the best word for PR purposes or whatever. Don't worry about that. I would say just attend to the reality and the, the substance of what we're going to describe here rather than focusing overly on the word. Right. As we put this in context, you'll see that the word itself doesn't have all the connotations that we think it does. So we right. have to describe then what that masculine charism is, what that feminine charism is. So once you see that, then it's going to take out those negative connotations of a sort of a superiority and, you know, the machismo, again, as, as uh, actually as John Paul II refers to. But so essence, so you talk to, I, I say it's essentially about us, a man giving his life, decreasing himself, self abnegation Now, I wrote that book 20 plus years ago, and that was actually before I was getting married and, and as I got married. So obviously I have to go back to it, make sure that I'm trying to toe the line on myself. But, and so now I'm in psychomoralytics, but psychomoralytics itself is about this maturation, which means dying itself on the natural level, decreasing the egoistic influences, the egoistic passion, so that the Mago Dei, the image of God and the rationality and volition really shines through. That's maturation on the natural level. And of course, on the Christian level, it's essentially about, I must decrease so Christ can increase. So I become a soul that magnifies the Lord. So this is all one piece. And of course, that's what's the beauty, the uniqueness of Catholicism. It all fits. Grace builds upon nature. There's no compartmentalization. It has to all be one piece. So this essence then for a, for a Christian man to be fulfilling his vocation as the head of his family, 
as a husband and father is one of his decreasing so Christ may increase. And that takes place, ego decreases via saying yes to humiliation, specifically. And, yeah. and so, which is quite the opposite of lording it over one. And that's how it's going to be effective. This is what sets your book apart. And, and I want to go back to what you said and what you say in the book. Christian patriarchy must be based for the first time in history solely on Christ and his divine commission. I think that is what sets you apart from perhaps many other advocates of traditional Christian manhood who would maybe perhaps dismiss some of the attempts of St. John Paul II to purify this order of marriage. Granted, it's easy to misread him there if you're not reading him in the context of prior church teaching. But I'd like to ask you, what do you mean for the first time in history? I mean, what is this implicit criticism of past Christian civilization you're making? Right. And I suppose it's you know not so much of a criticism, but to say that today only that pure Christian patriarchy, purely commissioned by Christ, will suffice. In the past, because there was already in place by a natural law and, and those pagan cultures that were in tune with natural law, there still was a patriarchal structure. You know, for better or for worse. So it wasn't something that was necessary to explicate. I think the church actually, in a lot of ways, she worked toward dismantling some of its uh, grosser abuses. For instance, um, you know, polygamy was one of the big ones. And she had to do so gradually. It wasn't just, you know, hey, you know, she was working with the powers that be. And as they converted, say, okay, so now let's stress the importance of this exclusive devotion, this monogamous relationship, of course, to, to manifest that very important um, point of Christ in the church. and But that was really a preaching of, of poverty and saying, embrace this asceticism for love of your wife and love of your family, die to yourself. So the church did that. And however, you know, unfortunately, we, and even up to this day, especially in some of the more ancient Christian cultures, there's still a huge double standard out there, if you will. And the man can be quite unfaithful, even though it's totally incorporated into this Catholic culture. So that's a weakness. And today it's not going to suffice. And today we need all the grace we can derive from that cross and for men to embrace that cross. I'm exclusively devoted to my wife. That means I love her more than I love myself. That means I love my family more than I love myself. It means I love Christ more than I love myself. That's sacrificial. But that kind of love is the only kind of love that is going to withstand the onslaught of the third millennium. For those who are interested in a more in-depth argument that, you know, what we're speaking about as patriarchy is indeed church teaching, they can look at, I believe, the second chapter of this book for that, as well as some in-depth theological discussion of it. The one point I would like to hear a little bit about in this interview is the inseparability of the hierarchy and the sacramentality of marriage, because that's something I hadn't heard before. Can you explain that? Yes, yes. Well, so interestingly enough, Ephesians 5 is something that people, sort of a feminist bent, have uh, wanted to excise from the scriptures. And sadly, we've actually done that sometimes when it comes up in the readings for the Mass on their own accord. They, they'll take it out and replace it with something else. But interestingly enough, it is this very teaching of, you know, wives be submissive to your husband, you know, is, is like the church is unto Christ. And husbands to love your wife like Christ loved the church. And we derive the sacramentality of marriage. This is where St. Paul talks about this. He says this is a great mystery or sacrament. That's, they say that, that's the foundation for marriage being sacramental. And of course, a sacramental marriage is necessarily monogamous. When someone wants to take out that particular passage of the sacramentality of marriage, they're also at the same time removing the greatest boom to femininity, which is monogamy and the indissolubility of marriage. That for better or for worse, they're going to have that assurance that that man will remain faithful to them and give his life for them until the end. And again, that giving the life again is what they, a woman is going to say, okay, I'm going to submit 
be submissive, docile. And we'll talk about a little bit what that means as well. It's not a blind obedience. But that's not Catholic. Blind obedience is never Catholic, even though it's been, maybe sometimes it has been a part of the church's or mentality, but it's not, blind obedience is not Catholic. We're talking about submission, it's love. And that means sometimes, obviously, I mean, it means you never have the option, really, to submit to anything that's sinful or vicious. And that's what has to be understood as well. True love is something that's going to, at times, also be at face value disobedient to a certain structure. And that can happen within, you know, with any structure there is, but especially in, even in, in the marriage with a husband or wife. But this is where a man, and so that wife's a submissiveness, but a man too, he's saying, you know what? And I also, I eschew all other women, all other affections. I mean, everything, not just women. It's, it's sports or it's this or that or other thing. To serve and be devoted to you first and foremost. My The crux of my energy is given to you to be there in that service and that protection, that provision, and ensuring the sanctification is taking place for this woman. And so that exclusivity is a dying itself for the man, just like a submission is for a woman. And for the man as well, you know, that's overall, it's his saying, I'm going to give my life for you, like Christ did for the church, which is, again, total and completely sacrificial. It's absolute. So it goes far beyond monogamy, this exclusivity. Absolutely. It does. It means I'm going to be exclusively devoted to my faith and family. So and it's, I'm not going to use my virility for having fun primarily. It's not going to be about that. It's not going to be about that playboy mentality, which was the 1920s, right? F. Scott Fitzgerald, whatever. A misuse of masculinity. I'm not going to go out there. My life's not about me having fun and having thrills. My life is about devotion to my family, first and foremost. And then everything else is secondary. Everything takes its order from that. You know, is this helping me? And, you know, and it can, I mean, you know, theoretically can help you, sports, whatever, any sort of recreation can help you be a better father and husband. It can prepare you to, for that, or, or it can energize you for that. But nonetheless, it has to take its, again, its order, its touchstone towards serving the, the wife and the family. So you've just talked about what you refer to in the book as a paradox of servant leadership. Can you talk about the paradox of magnanimity and humility? Let's, let's talk about that virtue of magnanimity, first of all. Yeah, magnanimity, that greatness of soul, as they say. And that greatness of soul is something that when I refer to it with men, now a lot of times in the past it's been something that's it's even something you know you, you inherit. It can be you know, if you're, you're royalty or whatever. But in the Christian dispensation, what I – propose is that this greatness of soul depends for man specifically on the cause he espouses. The greater the cause and the greater love he espouses that cause with, the greater the magnanimity. So again, so why it would be a, a misuse of masculinity to espouse a cause, and for a Christian man, for a cause less than faith and family. To espouse a cause, for instance, uh, you know, of your local sports team or even a nationalism would be a misuse of that cause. Because again, a nationalism, any true Catholic politics, is going to take its its touchstone. Is it good for the family? So it's that ordering and that passion. I'm serving Christ. I'm serving my family. And I'm serving my wife. And I'm serving my children. And I this is my life is given to to preserve them, to promote them. So they may flourish. How is it that magnanimity and humility go together? So, and again, this goes back to how this Christian understanding, it hasn't always necessarily, you know, and I know that you, you know, you, with your studying of, of antiquity and the ancient cultures, Aristotelianism, et cetera, Stoicism, but there is a, oftentimes that magnanimity is going to still have a lot of pride base. This can be about, you know, my excellence, my virtue, my strength. Well, true Christian magnanimity, and I'll say true Christian patriarchy itself, is not based on that. Because the recognition of all Christians, and, and including Christian men then and, and Christian patriarchs, is going to be 
their inadequacy, their inability, they, the fact that indeed, we say patriarchy, well, again, it's a term, but a term that ultimately only God in heaven is worthy of, fatherhood. As our Lord Jesus Christ said, call only God in heaven, Father. The point is that the rest of us are standing in his stead, but it's not intrinsic to who we are as a creature. And this goes into, we'll talk now, we can you know, segue into this after this about how a woman differs from a man in her integrity, but it's not intrinsic to any creature to be a father, to be a leader. What's intrinsic to creaturehood is receptivity. And so a man to say, okay, I'm going to stand in God's stead. I'm going to stand up and engage in this cosmic battle between good and evil, as opposed to, you know, you know the football game. Well, if you actually go and you're engaged in the battle, that cosmic battle, you're going to be overwhelmed. You're not going to be adequate. You're going to be scared. You're going to feel you know, you're foolish and you're weak, but you do it anyway for love of God. Love of your faith, love of your family, love of your wife, love of your children. You do it anyway, even though you don't feel that you can do it. See, what stops you from doing that is pride. I don't want to be humiliated. I don't want to feel overwhelmed, so I'm not going to go there. You go there anyway for love of God. And in doing so, you actually die to yourself. What you just said about receptivity being, you know, the sort of the lot of creatures in general is very interesting because I think some of the proponents that I've heard of Christian patriarchy or traditional manhood and femininity, they make it sound as though, you know, men are all active, women are all receptive. There's not so much of an appreciation of reciprocity and paradox, but in particular, there's a neglect of the fact that, you know, traditionally in Catholic mysticism, the soul is considered to be feminine in relation to Christ which would seem to imply that although men must be truly men, we're not talking about gender bending here, there is something that men actually have to learn from w women. And, and one of the ways that a husband would be sanctified in marriage is from actually learning that not only in uh, experiencing his wife's reciprocity in giving to her, but also learning from her to be that way in relation to Christ. Absolutely. No, absolutely. That's exactly right. And, you know, the book that, it, which right now is being revised, follow a book of celebrating God-given gender. And that, we speak, go very deeply into this, what it means, this need for receptivity as creatures. So we have a man and a woman, and there's different modes normally of achieving that receptivity. But again, a creature, like you said, a soul is the feminine. St. John of the Cross refers to a soul as the bride of Christ. And so that is if you will, why the perfect creature had to be a woman. She's totally receptive and our blessed mother. And so, and why our Lord, of course, you know, had to be a man because he, yes, our Lord Jesus Christ was the only man that ever walked this earth that was, that was worthy of the title father that actually was adequate in his fatherhood. So as we go through this, this here's the process of what when man was created and, and woman created, and you go back to Genesis. And I say, I'm, I'm going to be a proponent of evolution here because, you know, God made the the animals and we suppose he maybe made the primates last, you know, maybe some gorilla or chimpanzee. And then he made man, Adam, right? <laughs> you know, the next step. But then the final place of that, if you will, evolution or that higher form, he made woman. And as a spider masterpiece, and I think others have said that. So if you look at it, woman taken from man. See, Aristotle would say a woman is a misformed man. I mean, he had some vague understanding of that because she she's lacking something that man has. But if we look at this truly in, in the Christian understanding, and even philosophically and genetically, we see that woman was taken from man. We have this chromosomally, she was taken, she was taken, we have the X-ness taken from man. And, you know, I call it the X, X factor. It's something about women. Women is taken from man. And in a sense that a distillation, a purer 
element is taken from a coarser matrix. That's what we have in women. So man does have an Xness in him, but not in the, and not in the pure form, not in the same degree as a woman does. And so then you have, she is something pure. She's a, that liqueur, that sweetness. And again, there's something about women. It's again, the XX factor. Okay, well, what is it? You know, is it the erotic value? What is it? We don't, we don't know, it's, but it's always there. It's, it's so it's confusing, but no, it is this purity this goodness, this creatureliness. And actually, and this is what men have to be devoted to. They have to be devoted to that. Because even Adam, you know, he, he, here he was before Eve came, it wasn't good. His life was still, didn't have a meaning until she came and, and gave meaning to his life and directions to life. And a man has a desire to be one with, to be subsumed into the feminine because it is, it's, it's better, it's pure, it's, and he wants it. You know, if you, I mean, if you look, boudoirs, you know, they're going to be, they're very feminine. The man doesn't have a problem with that. He wants to be in that feminine environment. He wants to be subsumed into it. He desires it. And so we see that, of course, in the marital act and the traction between the genders. And of course, a woman in her femininity and her receptivity is receptive to the man. And in the same way that you know, she's going to be on the spiritual level, receptive to God. And that's why a woman is, her place is to be cloistered. I you know, say in the book, a woman's place is in the home. Not because she's not good enough for the world, but because she's too good for the world. This is the holy place. And she is really, by her nature, more contemplative. And we see that in our Blessed Mother, the piercing of the heart, etc. So, you know, I'll say with my, my work I do is in psychomoralytics, which again, it's a true form of psychology, of true psychologies, but a true study of the soul, treatment of the soul. But women, I can often talk to women. Just, we just talk. And they can allow that piercing of the heart to take place. But for man, it's not just the words. They're, they're not just contemplative. They're, you know, women aren't complicated. Women have a simpler, purer soul. The men are complicated in the sense they're complicated in the fact they can compartmentalize. They lack the integrity. So when I'm working with men, this goes back to magnanimity and how a man becomes receptive. You know, nine times out of 10, I have to say, okay, you have to go out and do something. You have to spouse the cause now. You have to walk the walk. And so they go out there and spell the cause. And even though they're overwhelmed, like I said, if we're fighting the battle, the cosmic battle, we're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to be humiliated. They go out there and they do this. They do battle. And then in the process, they're humiliated and they become receptive. It's an extra step that be brutalizing for women. So we try to keep them out of that sort of conflict. But for a man, you know, as I said, nature needs it. He needs to be knocked on his, on his rear, if you will, and yet still say, okay, it's all right. I'm sacrificing myself, my pride and self-love for love of my family and for love of my wife and for love of Christ. This applies to, as you said, our relationship with Mary as well. I mean, this isn't my insight. I, mean, I heard somebody else say this, but if the extent of your devotion to Mary is that kind of chivalric aspect of wanting to kind of praise her and defend her honor and things like that, there's something missing. There's something missing if you're not also trying to be like her as a man and, and learning from her receptivity from her humility, including learning from the specifically feminine aspects of her greatness. Yes. Yes. Let me say that uh, I'm definitely a mama's boy. All right. So, and you know, that's the great love of, of our lives. It's, it's supposed to be really just even in the natural order. The great love of one's life is one's mother. The, the last words of young men died on the battlefield is mommy. That's it. I mean, the vast majority of that's what it is. It's mommy. So that's our love. And that's what we have no doubt about that. She's there to help us walk the walk on the cross. But another thing you said too, you know, yes, a lot of people talk about, you know, my devotion to Blessed Mother, what have you. And you're going to find that along a lot of Catholics, you know, especially conservative Catholics or traditional Catholics. Great devotion to Blessed Mother. But they don't have a really devotion to femininity, to the women in their own lives, or even to their own womanhood. 
they don't understand how that translates. But we see in our Blessed Mother really what the feminine charism is. It is that sweetness. O Clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. So let's see that as something within the woman in our lives or within a, within a woman's own heart and soul and be devoted to it so that it becomes made manifest. And when you're devoted to something, you become you know, more like that as well. And so this devotion, unfortunately, you know, we, we have it, you know, within, you know, Catholic circles. Oh, women, you know, they're so emotional, so passionate, you know, that's, just, that's, that's ridiculous. And again, it's so complicated, but they're, no, they're not. But it's the, in fact, and St. Thomas says, and if, unfortunately, you hear a lot of times, Thomas say this, you know, they, they downplay the feminine. But St. Thomas says, you can't have true human flourishing without the passions. So passion is something that is a Catholic virtue. Now, we go into psychomoralytics, we make an important distinction, and is that there's psychic passions, passions that come from loving God and the truth, the good, and there's egoistic passions, which comes from loving self, because the chief passion is always loving what you love. So that's how we distinguish. Unfortunately, in trying to dampen down all the egoistic passions, we've taken a stoical approach even dampen down then the, the psychic passions. But of course, our lady and our Lord were fully passionate. And so we see that, again, as something to value in women. And yes, you know, men don't necessarily like it because it's a reality that they feel overwhelmed in. But nonetheless, they have to learn to, in a way that women don't, it was more natural for them to say yes, to the deep passions of life, to the overwhelmingness of life, to the fact ultimately that they're not in control. And of course, a woman with just her biology, she has to say yes to her cycles. And then if you know, she married, she has to say yes to the vicissitudes of pregnancy and childbirth. And men aren't forced to do that. It's not intrinsically forced to do that. It's not, not impelled to do it, but they must choose to do it. And so often I work with marital couples and the woman's changed. You know, she's having children, she's maturing, she's becoming maternal, she's becoming growing in sanctification. And the man, nary a change. Again, because he has to understand now, I have to double my efforts now to keep this woman this and child in a cloistered, pure environment. I have to go out there and man the barricades. I have to actually create Catholic culture, push it back. And, and so that is, so it facilitates my family's growth and holiness. Uh, you just mentioned in passing stoicism, taking a stoic attitude towards the passions or towards suffering. And that's uh, interesting, but we don't have to dwell on it. But it, you do mention in the, the bit about magnanimity that that was kind of the apex of pagan magnanimity. And it reminds me of an interview that I heard with a Catholic philosopher, Sarah Byers. I want to say she's at the University of Boston. She does a lot of work on St. Augustine and Stoicism. And the thing that she said that really struck me was that, you know, St. Augustine, so the Stoics say that suffering actually does not matter, that it's ultimately inconsequential. And they also don't believe in an afterlife. And that's why they have to say that, that suffering doesn't matter. And he says, no, it's okay, as she put it. You know, Augustine tells them, no, you don't have to lie anymore. You know, the afterlife exists. And not only does it give meaning to suffering, but it also means that things can ultimately be made right. Because the Stoics have, in seeing that in this life, you know, suffering cannot be completely redressed, have decided that means we have to just pretend it doesn't matter. But that's not the Christian approach, and it's not the Christian man approach. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And now I, I now have another new book coming out as well that's called Crucial Christianity. And we go into this because we go into a lot of the post-Trent period, the counter-reformational period, which a lot of times in conservative and traditional circles is held up, you know, this is what we have to go back to because, you know, we don't want to go into what the spirituality of the 60s and the 70s, but so let's go, let's go back to what it was like in the 50s. But there's a lot of, I mean, the 50s led to the 60s, so there's a reason that Christendom collapsed on itself so, so rapidly. And the Stoics say, yeah, don't worry about these things you can't do anything about. Those are the truly human things. Those are the truly human things. In fact, the afterlife, in my mortality, that's a great 
reality of physical existence, but there's, a, there's also the great reality of my contingency. That means the fact that I don't have to exist and I have no control over my existence. That means I have no control over existing or not. Now that's striking. You mean I have to exist? Yeah, you don't have a choice. You're going to exist for all eternity. <laughs> so, and that's incredibly humiliating. I have no control. It doesn't matter if I kill myself. This, you know, and it's because guess what? It doesn't matter. I'm still going to exist. That's a deep, deep reality. The Stoics will go. They'll they'll scamper over to the edge, you know, and and look over the edge into the abyss, and then they go, oh no, well let's scamper back to things that distract us. But with our Christian faith, we look into that abyss and we jump into it. We're not afraid of that reality. We live life fully and completely, but again, only by a saying yes to humiliation. So, and I don't, we're not looking here for Catholic, you know, again, you said about the machismo and this whole movement, you know, let's go out there and be knights and we're so tough and forget it. Everybody wants to be Chesterton and Belloc, you know, and, you know, <laughs> went through those times, maybe in college, try to pretend we were, you know, but uh, the cigars or the wide or what have you. But no, we're not Chesterton and Belloc. I, I say Chesterton and Belloc were the last men standing of an erstwhile Christendom. We're the first men that need to be kneeling in potential of this third millennium of a Christendom that's collapsed. And the only thing it's going to do, it's not going to be the might of our arms. It's going to be us saying yes to our humiliation and sorrow for love of Christ and the family, letting God's grace work through us by embracing the cross. So the whole, this is what Christian patriarchy means. It's a whole different animal. And as a matter of fact, as I mentioned before, nothing else is going to suffice. If you're going to go out to actually truly engage the evil that's out there, you have to be totally humble. You have to be sorrowful. Because if you're not, you're going to turn tail and run. But these are the kind of men we need for the third millennium. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm again, I'm again struck by how much deeper you go in your approach than so much of what I hear in in traditional circles on this, which often is, you know, a lot of it is strictly speaking true. But yeah, you know, that's what I, that's what amazed me with reading this book. Uh, you know, is I thought it would be good, maybe along those lines, but it just went so much deeper than I expected. The core of the the book, uh, the title is The Three Marks of Manhood, obviously. But you talk about the scepter, the crozier, and the cross. Now, the scepter is twofold. You have the scepter of self-discipline and the scepter of authority. The necessity of self-discipline for the proper use of authority, it's a truism, but it's often overlooked, I think, probably by men who want to reclaim their rightful place, so to speak, in the family. So I don't know how much we need, how much detail we need to go into on that, but we, we we should probably discuss it at least a bit. This scepter of self discipline. Well, you know, and and I'll say I, I have you know again I wrote that book you know over twenty years ago. Oh, so it was published before two thousand ten. I wrote it in you know before two thousand. Oh, and okay. I, and I act and and actually Thomas uh, Nelson, who was was the was the founder of Tan, had it. And then he passed away, got rest of And then, you know, it went to St. Benedict's Press and has, in a sense, eventually, you know, saw the light of day. But in 2010. So, but that was, yeah, that was like 10, you know, 10 years later. So there's been, of course, there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. Uh, and I think, like I said, I, I still have to try to, you know, live out those principles. But this, the, the understanding has gotten deeper and deeper still, you know, even, even deeper. And the understanding, and I, again, I talk about this a lot in my, my new book on Crucial Christianity. Because it talks about this, this, this whole, the, the virtue-based, the Aristotelian virtue-based masculinity. And this was very popular, uh, even in psychology, Catholic psychology, in the last century, 30s, 40s, 50s, mental hygiene, and, you know, you know pulling pull yourself up by the boots. And, you know, okay, praise God, you know, I mean, nothing to, uh, we don't want to um, condemn that. But I work with a lot of people that are, that are very broken, hurt, you know, and they, they're not able to pull themselves up by their, by their boots. And so we go a different way. And acquired virtue is not specifically Catholic. There's a lot of people that have a lot of virtue out there. And you mentioned the military or you know, sports or whatever else. They have acquired virtue, but it's still pride-based. And acquired virtue can always be lost. It's durable, but can always be lost. 
But, and Thomas talks about this, and, and I, I talk about more in, in, in the new book, Crucial Christianity, but the the idea that it's not something that is specifically Christian. What is specifically Christian is what I refer to and what I've learned to define and develop in psychomoralytics is a receptivity, receptive virtue. I can say yes to reality. I can say yes to ego abnegation, humiliation, and sorrows for love of God. That's the essence. Now, that's, it's similar to the infused virtues, but it's almost where the infused virtues are sanctifying grace. This is like an actual grace that goes hand in hand with it. And so that receptivity, again, we're talking about the feminine, we're talking about men, be receptive. You know, I say to men, you know what? You go out there, do what you have to do for love of God anyway, say yes to humiliation and sorrow, and then you can have the courage that derives from loving God, loving your family, loving your wife or your children. That's what gives you courage because what? Perfect love casts out all fear. That's where we derive our courage from, that love. I love my, I love Christ. I love my wife more than I love myself. See, and I tell that, and that's really what we need to do. I mean, this, that's the whole basis for a good marriage. I tell, I tell women, don't find a man that loves you more than he loves anything and he's just heading over heels in love with you. Find a man that's head and heels in love with Christ. Then he'll always be faithful to you no matter what. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's so, the, so, that's, so the discipline. necessity so, of that. Yeah, so, I'm, so I say that, yes, the self-discipline, but again, we're going to go deeper. It's not just about the Pharisee in the front of the temple was very disciplined, wasn't he? He was disciplined. He did all that stuff. He fasted all that uh, and prayed all those times. And But he wasn't who our Lord said we should emulate. He says, no, you know what? Be the broken one down there. Say yes. Say yes to your wretchedness. Say yes to your humiliation. Because by doing that, I, and tell you, this is, again, you know, I, I want, you know, I encourage you to read Psychomoralytics and also the um, Crucial Christianity when it comes out, because this is what we talk about. It's saying, this is for the weak and foolish. And you can say, when you say yes to your wretchedness, humiliation, you ate, and do things for the love of God, as opposed to saying, okay, I'm going to become this. So, so I have to go through this. So it's delayed gratification. Now, you know, athletes do that. You know, you know soldiers do that. Right, they have a lot of that acquired virtue. They they delay gratification, they make incredible sacrifices, so they can become somebody, an idealized self, and that's a spiritual exercise. But it's still one that has pride and self love as a motivational factor, and it's not necessarily bad. You know, pride and self love, you know, we're, we're, it's involved in what we do. It doesn't mean it's sinful, but it's imperfect. So we want to reestablish, at least wise, what the perfect Christian virtue is, and that is what we're talking about. At the foot of the cross, there was no there was no acquired virtue. You have our blessed mother. She didn't have acquired virtue. She was always perfect. She never acquired it. She just always said yes in the moment to our Lord. Now, see, acquired virtue is a habit. That means sometimes it kind of takes. It's not an act of pure love all the time. It's just a habit. Pure this 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 receptive virtue, and coupled with infused virtue, is pure. Every heartbeat is an act of love and yes. Mary Magdalene. <laughs> didn't have any acquired virtue, quite the opposite. So she was saying yes with every heartbeat to her humiliation and sorrow for love of Christ. And whose heart was right there with our blessed mother? It's hers. Praise God. Or St. Dismas, obviously, didn't have any acquired virtue. Right. Yeah. And so this well, that's is- really profound. It is. Which, and I've been blessed because in my profession, what was I going to, you know, what do I, what do, I do? With these people that have been so broken, and you know, some, you know, from from day one, dear Lord, and so you say, but by the grace of God, there go I. But we all do there go eventually go there, and the beautiful thing about this this receptive virtue, like infused virtue, is that it can be lost just like that. With that next heartbeat, it can be lost, but it ne need never be lost. And even if it's lost, with the next heartbeat, it can be regained. If I lose it by sinning. I say yes to the humiliation and sorrow of my sin. Not only do I undo that sin, but I actually advance the kingdom. You talk about a number of aspects of self-discipline, including the upbringing of sons, initiation into manhood and things like that. I think we can leave that for people who get the book to discover. But you did talk about uh, one point I'd like to, to focus in on is 
the danger of seeking your masculine identity in a relationship with a woman. Now, we've already said that actually the relationship to women and the feminine is crucial to understanding masculine identity. But you are talking here about, a spe- you know, in a specific relationship with a specific woman. In other words, sort of like proving yes. your, your masculinity to yourself in some way. Yes, absolutely. You know, right. Yeah. You know, so we're talking about, you know, is, should, should a, a young man or adolescent start dating before he's even a man? Well, no, <laughs> that's absurd. You know, become a man first. And now, so let's go back to so what that means to be a man. So, and there's a lot of books out there talk, you know, talk about how you discipline yourself, taking cold showers, da, da, da. And that's, that's all great. I was in the Marine Corps actually twice. So, so you know, I, I, and I played football. I did a lot of stuff. So I, I understand it. But it's, it's, this is a, but there's a better way of understanding this. The specifics can work themselves out. And that's going to vary, you know, household to household, culture to culture. It's going to vary. But the key is for those young men, you know, the whole idea is what do you ask? You talk to a young man and say, so, yeah, so what do you think you want to be? You know, and you're trying to figure it out. Well, we are, they already should know what the God destines them to be. They're destined to give their lives for faith and family, no matter what it is, no matter what it is. That's what they're destined to do. I mean, as a father, obviously, you know, as a priest, they're going to do that anyway. They're, because that's, you know, the, the, the laity are our families. They're given, they, they're to serve the families, minister unto the families. So you say, so for them too, it's about magnanimity. It's about saying, you espouse these causes. You're giving your life. It's not about you. It's about you serving your faith and your family. And in that regard, then, of course, you want to, there's a distinction here, you know, in, in raising boys and girls. Uh, there, there is, I mean, I mean, God is, if you will, you know, sexist. He doesn't believe in equality in the sense he believes in in, in, in complementariness, but there's differences here. Oh, the, the woman is, is treated in a, in, in a more reverential way. She's, she's, we talk about the blossoming of the feminine heart, how it happens in nature and grace. It's, it's a, it, in a proper environment, that feminine heart naturally blossoms. Because again, why? It's intrinsic to the woman. It's intrinsic to her nature. She has that purity, that integrity. For the man, he has to become a man. He has to take upon himself something that is not intrinsic to him. So in a sense, he has to do violence to himself. He has to choose to do that. And that's why we look back the fullness of time in, in our Lord's time, in our Blessed Mother's time. Our Blessed Mother, what, she was 14, 15 years old, and she was able to fulfill her vocation, her maternal vocation. But not our Lord. I mean, he could have, but in his culture, they understood. That culture said, yes, that's the right age for a woman. That's all she has to do. For for a man, his fullness of his vocation to be a rabbi, to teach, to be that father, he had to be 30 years old, twice as long. That's the understanding. A man has to become a man. It's not intrinsic to him. So that's that process. You learn, you discipline yourself. You, first and foremost, you know, you're going to, as you're growing as an adolescent, what's the most important thing? Is that purity. Your virility, you need to order it. And virility, the vast majority of virility is not ordered toward procreation. Procreation is obviously only a very small aspect of you know, a, a person's life. And even when you do procreate and you have a family, well, you're going to be spending your virility in a proactive way to provide and protect for that family. So that young man needs that virility ordered. But he hasn't ordered so early toward. He has to be engaged, if you will, in a battle. He has to be engaged in something, not just again a misuse of virility, be it by playing sports or, or, or worse yet, but by saying I'm using my virility, my strength to serve God and my family. I'm going to go out there and and and, and do that battle and have that that courage to give my life for my family. So that's properly ordering them. So that uh, it doesn't get caught up in, in into, of course, any of the, the impurity, which is absolutely debilitating for a man. And so a young man needs to be inculcated in that. But, if, you know, again, and, and fathers too. Fathers are supposed to have a vision in Christ for their family. It's, it's, it, that's a charism that they have. Gain the vision. Just the same way that St. Joseph gained a vision for the Holy Family. Again, when the Holy Family was in danger. 
you know, the angel of God did not go to the perfect creature, the Blessed Mother, did not go to God Almighty, the high priest himself. No, he went to St. Joseph and told him to take the woman and flee. And so the men have to have a vision themselves, but a lot of times if they don't have a vision, if somehow they're not exclusively devoted to their wives, and that could be in any form of impurity or you know, from the, from the heart to actual acting out, they're not going to have that vision. Exclusivity and that purity is so key to the Christian patriarchal charism. Again, sacrificial. Have you found in your work in counseling people that there are a lot of Catholic men and women who, you know, at a young age, you know, maybe maybe went to a Catholic college, graduated, immediately got married, thought, you know, this is what I have to do. I gotta gotta find a spouse got to get married. This is what I'm supposed to do as a Catholic man or woman. And they actually had no idea who they are or, uh, you know, both, both, you know, as men and women specifically and in Christ and therefore are unable to actually know who the person they're marrying is. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I deal with that quite often, obviously. So it's because we have, yeah, a lot of these Couples of meet in different Catholic colleges, and I probably work with every single alumni in every in every college that we know out there. And the problem being, then, let's say I mean Catholics are better at that. I, I was in, when I was in grad school, uh, John Paul II Institute. There were there weren't that many married uh, grad students yet as like, Catholics. When I went to a, uh, a school that was affiliated with a, a Protestant church in, gra- in, in graduate school for my for my doctorate, and all the Protestants are married. They get married right, you know, in college or, or right after college. Um, none of them have any children, though, of course, but but they're all married. So Catholics are a little bit better than that. But the problem being is this. If we, we don't have gender-specific education anymore, right? So that was always, the church always did that. Back in the good days when people <laughs> weren't gender-confused, right? We had, yeah, we this separated. Is this is in Divini Ilius Magistri, the encyclical by, I believe, Leo the Thirteenth, if I'm not mistaken. He talks about this coeducation problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so uh, this is so so. It's, so the strange thing is, yeah, today we got it so wired that we have the gender thing so wired we we can go ahead and do away with it, right? <laughs> exact opposite. We need to be very specific as far as gender education. And so in high school and in college. And it's not being done in any of the colleges, any of the good colleges, the good small Catholic colleges, you know, with the classical education, what have you. They're not doing it. So it's, it's, it's not being done because we're trying to recreate something maybe in the past, um, but yet adapt yourself to the current uh, culture. And the need to understand these principles of femininity and masculinity and the fact that men and women learn differently. I think probably most of the colleges really, uh, if you look at the small Catholic colleges, they're based on this cl- classical curriculum. That's probably really a masculine curriculum to begin with. It, it's, and, and so uh, and then, but we're going we're to bring the, the women on. And oftentimes it was done even on the early days. Sometimes there were a couple of these colleges that they had wanted um, it to be all male, but they didn't have the numbers. So they, they, they admitted women. But the need to have really gender specific education is abs- is really crucial. We've tried to do some work on that our- ourselves uh, through our our institute, but it's uh, there's, a, there's a crying need for that. So yes, for a man, he has to become a man first. Now, and I'll say at the same time, if you have an 18-year-old or a 22-year-old man and woman, well, really, you know, almost, almost universally, the woman's going to be more mature. She, again, she has an intrinsic blossom of the heart. It takes place unless it is somewhat stultified by an environment or what have you. So, but the woman's more mature. So there's still, there's, there's actually, it militates against that man being able to be a father. I mean, again, you know, he, he already has to do something that is not, he's not adequate for. But then, you know, it, so this, if you will, will will suggest that an a discrepancy when man has already become a man he has to go out and win his spurs and the, where the woman is her heart has has blossomed at a younger age so you can see there there's there's probably going to be a j age discrepancy there 
I think this became popular in, in, in the culture somewhere along the line. Some people had mentioned it to me, but I read about this one formula. It was an old book I wrote, read, read by some Irish priest somewhere, you know, and back before the uh, internet, some dusty tomes. But he talks about the formula like everybody knew it. Of course, we've all heard half a man's age plus seven for the formula of, of the age of a woman to be that you marry. So, so in other words, if a man was 30, the woman would be 22. And, and the older the man got, the older the woman got, the, the more the age discrepancy, which would make sense, you know, as, as people get set in their ways, what have you. But so half age plus seven. Have you heard that one? Yeah, I think I have heard that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that, that what you're saying is certainly true. Um, at the same time, you know, we are seeing uh, a situation in which very often, even in Catholic homes, uh, women are are not – that they are thwarted in some ways in their, their natural development. And, uh, you know, I, I do see a lot of Catholic women out there, especially those who are really listening to the secular culture and ideology and stuff who do almost have like a kind of immaturity in the way that young men do, not in the sense that they're going around, you know, sowing their wild oats or something like that necessarily, but, but in this, in the sense of a kind of, a chaotic kind of rebellion against their identity. So, so it's interesting how our culture has created that uh, almost a similar effect of kind of youthful female immaturity as well. Well, right. Because why? Because they want to be like boys. And what do boys do? Well, they have fun. They can have all the fun. Okay. Well, I'm saying, guess what? I mean, being a man, thought about having fun. You know, it's not about having games. It's not about going. No, it's about serving the family. Who's the heart of the family? The woman. So these women, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, you know, I work a lot with, you know, the conservative traditional Catholics, you know, in traditional circles. And you know, they tell the girls, you know, you know, you know, you get your wear, wear a dress, you know, and, and tell, tell the married woman, you know, wear a dress and have a lot of babies, you know, and get it done like a man, basically. They have no value of the feminine. There's no value. Again, yeah, all the devotion huh. to the blessed mother. How about that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, it's, it's, and so they don't have a devotion to her, to the feminine. They have no idea what that means. And they say they have it, right? You know, they'll, they'll, they'll bring, you know, flowers to the statue of Blessed mother, <laughs> you know, but not necessarily to their wives, right? So they don't understand. And the women don't understand what it means to be a woman. They really don't. It's this masculine standard. So we have to rediscover what it means, this feminine charism, this purity, this sweetness, this receptivity. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a holy thing. That's why a man goes out into the world. That's why, you know, whatever it is, into, into the profane, the secular, that's why he does battle solely and completely just to preserve that feminine goodness. So that we really have to have an education of what, it, of what it means femininity is and be devoted to it and understand it. It's the, it is the better part. It's a sweeter part. It, it's the only reason for a man to actually go out and do anything. I said, you know, I, I don't know what Adam was doing before Eve came, but he was kind of hanging around, you know, hanging around the animals, and he was, you know, bored out of his mind, I think. Okay, everybody, this interview went quite a bit longer than I anticipated because there was so much to talk about with this book, and Dr. Dillsaver was so generous with his time. So I decided to split it into two episodes. So that's going to be it for today. But in a week, you'll hear part two, in which we discuss the three staves that form the core of this book, continuing the scepter. We, we talked about the scepter of self-discipline, and we'll follow up with the scepter of authority, and then the crozier of co-episcopacy and the cross of redemption. So tons of rich stuff coming for you next week. And even then, we won't have exhausted what the book has to offer, even with two episodes worth of conversation about it. Oh, by the way, the audiobook and ebook of The Three Marks of Manhood are significantly discounted on the TAN website at the moment, so I'll link to that on the show notes. In the meantime, Monday, June 22nd, is the feast of my patron saint, St. Thomas More, and we are going to have a whopping three episodes celebrating his feast, but not on this podcast. So two of them will be on Criteria, the Catholic film podcast. Those will be discussing the film and the play A Man for All Seasons. So we'll have our normal film discussion because we've been covering the Vatican film list and that's on there. But there's also a separate episode coming out on Monday 
That is my interview with a Moore scholar on the question of Thomas Moore's views on freedom of conscience and the degree to which the film gets those views right. And then on Catholic Culture Audiobooks, we're going to have a real treat for you, a dramatized reading of St. Thomas More's Dialogue on Conscience. These are actually two letters written by Thomas's daughter, Margaret, in which she describes some of the last conversations they had before his execution. So again, there'll be a dramatized reading of that, our first dramatized reading that we've done over on Catholic Culture Audiobooks. So all of those episodes will be out on their respective podcasts by Monday, and you can find them all at catholicculture.org slash podcast or subscribing to them in your favorite podcast app. Finally, if you appreciate the work we do here, please consider donating at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. God bless you, and I'll see you in a week with the continuation of this interview on the three marks of manhood by G.C. Dillsaver. Saver.